if all your eggs are in that one basket and they decide that they don't want you on their platform, you know, you're in trouble. So protecting yourself by um, gaining that listing site independence is, is really important. This is episode number four of Short-Term Rental Success Stories. Welcome back to Short-Term Rental Success Stories. I'm your host, Julian Sage. This is a show where I talk to hosts about their journey in starting and growing their short-term rental business. My goal is that you'll be able to walk away with practical information that will help you become a better host and learn how to scale your business. So we have a really kind review on iTunes from Jay Fu. He says, this podcast is great. There are a few short-term rental podcasts out there that are either poorly edited, edited, or the content is so-so. This is a combo of great content and great quality. Highly recommend. Thank you so much, Jay Fu. That really means a lot that you would support the show by leaving a review. It really does help the show grow. New podcasts, new shows are very challenging to get off the ground, uh, but we are growing, growing slowly and steadily. This past episode, uh, we've actually reached the 200 mark. So the last episode, we were uh, saying, you know, this is awesome. We reached 100 downloads and now we've actually doubled that. So that's a 100% gain right there, which is so awesome and i'm so glad that you guys are enjoying this content if you have any uh, questions or any anything that you would like me to maybe hit on the show that i am not already talking about then please send me a message on facebook go to the group and, and leave a comment and let me know how i can improve the show because that's what i want to do i want to be a better host uh airbnb host like i always say and a better podcast host Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Gary Cook. Now, Gary is a full-time IT located in Denver, Colorado, who's been doing short-term rentals since 2014. Gary's the proud owner of five properties located in the Rockies catered to adventure seekers called, appropriately, Sasquatch Vacations. Gary is our first guest who is a full-time W-2 worker, so he's got a full-time job, but he's also scaling and growing a short-term rental business on the side. This is a really fun interview because Gary shares a lot about his experience in doing the job full time while also growing and scaling the short term rental business. So a lot of really great tips for people that are trying to build this business, the short term rental business on the side when you do have that full time job. He goes into a lot of detail with how he automates his process and how he's made it easy for him to be able to manage his properties, spend time with his family and do his full time job. If you'd like my show notes for this episode and every future episode sent directly to your inbox, then go on over to shorttermsage.com backslash show notes to have them sent to you. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Welcome back, host. Today, I have the special honor of speaking with Gary Cook. Gary is located in Denver, Colorado and has five units, uh, most of them in the Rocky Mountains, so really beautiful. Uh, Gary, would you mind letting the audience know a little bit more about who you are and what inspired you to get into short-term rentals? Yeah, sure. So um, what inspired me? You know, I I had some money sitting in the stock market and I thought that uh, it was a little too volatile or or maybe it wasn't tax advantaged enough. I mean, I was maxing out my IRA 401k. So with the other money that I was putting in, I said, you know, maybe I should diversify a little bit more and put that into some real estate. And so I decided to buy a place that I can enjoy using up in the mountains and also retire to eventually. And so I bought a piece of property there. And while I, you know, continued working here in Denver and using that occasionally and actually remodeling it on the weekends, um, you know, I started to think that uh, it would be better if I could actually make some money on it, if I was renting it out, because that money that I used to purchase it was actually, you know, doing work for me in the past. It was working for me. It was making more money. Now I've just got it sitting in something. And while yes, there's appreciation there, I'm only going to realize that if I ever sell the property. So that's why I decided to start short-term renting. Okay. And you, you said you have, you have, uh, five properties now. Um, what, what was the most challenging part of a starting on Airbnb? Well, uh, you know, I'm still growing and and so I'm still facing new challenges every day. Um, But the challenges are really what keeps me going. You know, I'm a problem solver. So, uh, you know, it's not just about um, how do I make a guest happy, right? It's how do I make 
every guest happy in the future and not run into these same issues that maybe this guest had today. So, you know, similarly, if, if my business is taking up too much of my time and taking time away from family, then, you know, I, I need to find a way to automate that, solve those problems so that uh, I can spend more time with family. I would say probably the most challenging thing that I've run into was, um, you know, about uh, three or four years in when I really wanted to start working on listing site independence and uh, building my own presence and my own website, trying to find a, a good booking engine and, and good software to to handle that for me. That was that was the most challenging piece. So you said that finding finding the tools that could best support your your business was was the most challenging part of of starting off. Yeah, there, there's quite a few different pieces of software out there that can, um, you know, help to to automate your business and and uh, make it a little more hands off, uh, especially as you grow to more than one property. Uh, they all have different pricing structures and different features and, and and different things they do well and 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 don't do well maybe. So, uh, you know, putting those all together head to head and you know they usually offer a free two week trial. So trying them all out within a two week period or, or, you know, one after the other and trying to find out which one would fit my needs best. Uh, that, that was, that was quite the ordeal. It took me about, I would say two to three months to get that all hashed out. But once I did, it, it really changed the way I do business. Right. And before we started the the recording, uh, we were speaking a little bit and you actually are, uh, you, you do Airbnb, VRBO, um, and direct bookings part time. Uh, your your primary job is IT. So, you know, I think you're actually the first guest that we have on the show that they are just doing um, short term rentals part time. So how how have you been able to manage your full time job, which is 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 supporting your lifestyle, but also start to grow this short term rental business? Yeah. So so again, it's all about automation and having the right the right team and, and the right um, and the right software in place to, to help you out with that. I mean, it started out, you know, doing my job during the day, my regular W2 job in IT, and then working on this business in the evenings. And that was really taking a lot of time away from my family, you know, and, and kind of took a toll on me at first, you know, it was go to work all day, you know, have dinner with the family and then go down, you know, to my office and, and work on my business. And, uh, you know, the kids would be in bed by the time that I was done with that. And, it, 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 as I said, it took a toll. So, you know, that's why I had to work on automation and, um, you know, really bringing in the right tools and the right people to help me with my business so that I could spend more time uh, with the family, you know, taking what is, you know, real estate is oftentimes looked at as a passive investment, right? Depending on what you're doing. Well, if you're doing short-term rentals, it's a lot less passive than maybe other forms of real estate investing, but it can be more passive with the right tools and the right team in place. And and what type of tools and um, uh, structure for your team? Uh, when we when we were speaking, you said that you have a, a housekeeper account and and you're using a, a PMS booking platform or booking platform. A PMS just being a uh, I believe it's a project management. Is it or uh, property management property, property software management. service? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so what what type of uh, automation and, and tools have you been utilizing to be able to take the stress off of your primary job, your W2 job to be able to, um, uh, also grow this business? Well, you know, with, with a, with a regular job, you know, W2 job, you go into work during a set time. You know, if you, if you're lucky enough to have flex time, like I do, that's great. You know, you can do things throughout the day and maybe catch up in the evenings. But most of the time I'm working, you know, pretty much eight to five Monday through Friday. Um, with a short term rental business, you can't really control when you're working. And if you want to, you know, be able to respond to people quickly, uh, it can be difficult if you're in a meeting or, or, you know, working on a project or something at your job. So really the, the tools that are necessary for that piece uh, to free you up, I think, from the regular job are, are the automated tools for the automated uh, email responses, um, uh, allowing people to book online, um, you know, being able to answer some of their questions, uh, you know, using, using automated uh, email triggered emails, um, 
based on things that they're doing. For instance, uh, Airbnb doesn't make people sign a rental agreement like like a VRBO does or like you do when you're at my website. So one of the things that I have people do is when they book on Airbnb, my PMS software picks that up. It gets the message. You know, I'm not lifting a finger at this point. And it responds to them and says, hey, thanks for booking. And, you know, as outlined in the um, house rules on Airbnb, we need you to sign this rental agreement. Come on over to the website, sign that rental agreement. Once that's signed, because not everybody does it right away. Sometimes they say, well, you know, I want to take a minute to look this over or look it over with my spouse or whatever. Uh, Once they sign that rental agreement, then that triggers another automated message that says, okay, you know, you'll receive your, depending on the time too. So if it's within 10 days of their stay, we'll right away send out the welcome message. It says, here's your access instructions. Here's how you get to the property. Here's all the fun things you can do while you're at the property. And uh, if not, then we'll just send a quick message saying, hey, 10 days out, we'll send you all this information. And then we do that later on down the road. And your your, uh, property management software, it automatically has that all built into it? Yes, it does have all those features built in. You do have to do, of course, a little bit of configuration based on, you know, what you want to trigger particular emails, how often you want them to be sent or uh, what frequency you want them to be sent and, uh, you know, how close to the booking or, or after the booking. You know, after someone has left three days out, then I'll have it trigger an email message that says, hey, would you take a moment to review us on whatever particular online travel agency you booked through? and on our Facebook page, and on Google. Is the rental agreement specific to where you're located? Because uh, over, over in Maryland, we don't, we don't need to have rental agreements signed. Is that something that you have to do being in Denver? Do you have to do it? Well, that, that's a question you should you know, consult your, your lawyer on, right? Uh, and you should have a good lawyer as part of your team. But um, do you have to do it? I've heard people say both ways. You you don't need it or other people say you can't live without it. Personally, I'm a fan. I like to lay things out. I like to set proper expectations for my guests that, you know, look, if you book this and, you know, you've never been to an area with snow before, that's great. Come and enjoy the snow. But if you can't drive your car over the pass and you didn't rent, you know, a shuttle from the airport, uh, that that's not our issue. You know, you, you've booked this place, uh, well in advance, we weren't able to rent that time to anyone else. So, you know, if if you can't get over the pass for whatever reason, you know, please don't expect a refund. So there's things like that that are specific to our area. You know, we're, we're in a high alpine environment in the Rocky Mountains. Um, you know, it, it can be challenging. Now, we do have uh, the roads cleared by plows all the time, but there are people that still do have some challenges getting uh, through those roads, even in the in the lightest of snows, unfortunately. Is your rental agreement, is that more like, like if I, if I'm going to be renting a place, uh, with, with landlords, is yours kind of set up like that? Because, uh, from what, from what it sounded like to me, it sounded more like the, like the house, like the Airbnb house rules is, is, are they different or is there more legal, um, more legal power to your rental agreement than rather than like house, house rules? Yes, yes, I would say that there definitely is. I mean, it it is laid out in in very clear legal terms, and you know that was just one example of of uh, one of the things that we have in there. But then there's also, uh, for instance, if you're staying at one of our pet friendly properties, then there is a a, a rental agreement addendum that is tacked on uh, to anyone staying at one of those properties. So it's another page that outlines, you know, what what the expectations are if you're bringing your pet. You know that uh, you'll You'll clean up after them when you're walking them on a leash uh, around the property and that if you leave them alone uh, on the property at any time uh, that they'll be in a kennel or a crate, which we do provide those as well so that, um, you know, dogs can be kenneled because even even the, the best behaved dogs can be a little anxious uh, in a place that they're not familiar with. So you know, I've had my own issues with my own dogs uh, early on when I, when I first uh, got into this business and my dog actually got locked into um, a bedroom. She jumped up on the door and locked the door and, and then ended up uh, damaging the carpet before I could get the door off of the hinges. So, you know, these are the things that uh, you learn along the way. And then you, you, you know, every time you do learn something like that, you, 
you've got to make sure that you don't have to learn it again. Put it in the rental agreement. Make sure that everybody's aware of it. Put it into your automated systems. Put it into your emails, your guest book. You know, make sure that you only have to make these mistakes once. Mistakes are good because you learn from them, but they're only good if you actually learn from them, right? Wow, that's 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 sage advice. Mis- mistakes, you know, mistakes are good, but only if you learn from them. You know, it's not not good if you keep on making the same mistake more than once. What's what's that uh, term? If you if you keep on repeating the same thing over and over, the, that's, that's the definition of insanity. The right? Definition of insanity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the rental agreement. I'm I'm really I'm really interested in this. Have you found that uh, the rental agreement has helped you more because you've been on the platform on multiple platforms vrbo airbnb uh since 2014 uh, you were saying that you've been on and off with airbnb have you found that because of your rental agreement you have been able to win more claims against issues that have come up or uh then then opposed to just like the regular house rules or what, whatever the the airbnb house manual says i wouldn't say that i've won any claims in fact i haven't had a lot of i guess claims or, or disputes or anything with guests. And and I think that's why. I think the rental agreement is why. Again, you set those expectations ahead of time. You tell them, look, this is what we expect of you as guests, and, and here's what you can expect of us as hosts. And, you know, once you set those expectations and you're clear about them going forward, uh, you shouldn't really have a whole lot of disputes. And if you do, then you, you can clearly state, hey, this is what was agreed to and we shouldn't be having these these disputes at this time. Have you found that the rental agreement, uh, when you send it, does it scare off uh, potential customers? I've never had anyone scared off by it, no. I think it's kind of expected. I mean, you wouldn't expect to, uh, you know, if you didn't own a home and you were renting and you wanted to sign a year lease with somebody, would you expect to do that without signing that lease? I mean, you're renting a place. You're, 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 if you go to a hotel, same thing, right? You're, you're going to have to sign something. You don't just hand over your credit card. They, they do give you paperwork to sign. Do people always read it? Probably not. But, you know, I believe it's expected. Uh, I'm unsure why Airbnb doesn't do it the way others do. But that's okay. You know, again, if you use your own PMS and you put it clearly in your house rules that this is what's expected of you, then, you know, you can require that. I, I think I think the the rental agreement is a really good um, tool. I think a lot of people are afraid to give rental agreements because they think that it's going to scare off the same thing with like security deposits. They think if I charge them a security deposit, then they're not going to want to stay with me. But but like you said, if you stay at a hotel or you stay with anybody, you're you're signing an agreement, whether you read it or not. You're basically saying I'm going to comply by these rules, and if I don't, then I'm going to you know something bad's going to happen. Yeah, I would say that. Uh you hit on something there, the security deposit, that is very important. You definitely need to have a security deposit. And it's not due to disputes or, or anything like that that we've been talking about. I mean, accidents happen. You know, things go wrong. Like I said, with, with my dog, she tore up the carpet, my own dog, you know, while I was trying to get the door off to, to let her out of this room that she had locked herself in. Those things do happen. And when they do, you know, you're going to be expected to pay for them. Uh, you know, I stay in, in short-term rentals myself when I travel and I, you know, certainly am, I'm always willing to pay a security deposit. And if I accidentally, you know, knock over a lamp and break it, I fully expect that, you know, there's going to be $40, $50 deducted from my deposit. If, if that happened to me, same as if I was at home and I broke something, you know, I would have to replace it. And, and going back to, to, uh, you trying to automate everything, what, uh, what, you use that property management software, which I think is, is really awesome. And I'm definitely going to look into that myself. What other ways have you been able to automate your, your business so that, you know, when you are at your full-time, full-time job that you can, you can manage up, you know, five properties now and you're, you're continuing, continuing to scale. Yeah, I would say most of that is, is built in. Most of the automation is built into the PMS. Other, other tools that I use are, uh, I would say, you know, quite frankly, Gmail has been, uh, a real boon for my business. It's, it's been, it's been, it, it makes it really easy for me to uh, respond from my domain, you know, to, to actually look like, Hey, this is, you know, or how do I phrase this? You know, not look like I'm just some guy with a Gmail address, right? 
I mean, I have a business and where am I hosting that business? You know, I have my Sasquatch Vacations website and you're going to receive email from Sasquatch Vacations. And I don't think enough people realize that you can do this with an, with an online mail agent. You don't need to spend a whole lot of money uh, on a, a professional package with, um, you know, uh, some domain hosting provider. Um, Gmail has the tools built in to uh, allow you to not only um, send and receive from your, your domains that you you've purchased for your business, but quite frankly, prior to uh, the point that I, started using a PMS, uh, I used a lot of um, features in Gmail like canned responses. So back then it was still a little bit manual, but I wasn't typing up a new message every time. And I didn't have to go to uh, my notes and copy and paste it into a message. You know, Gmail has like canned responses that you can save and just bring those up, fill them out and, and send them to your guests when necessary. And what has been the most challenging part of scaling your Airbnb business? So when you had your first your first short term rental, and then you started getting one and two, and now you're up to five. What, what's been the most challenging part of that? You know, again, I think the most challenging part was um, early on trying to uh, gain the listing site independence. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that we worry about and we hear horror stories, at least I do, um, in some of the groups that I'm in and, and, and the people I talk to about, um, you know, if, if you violate the terms of an OTA, even unknowingly, sometimes they will simply drop you. I mean, there are a lot of other properties out there that you're competing against. And, um, you know, if all your eggs are in that one basket, and they decide that they don't want you on their platform, you know, you're in trouble. So protecting yourself by um, gaining that listing site independence is, is really important. And it can be a challenge. There's, there's a lot of parts and pieces to that. You've got to think about uh, not only the management uh, software that, that allows you to do the bookings, but you've got to think about marketing as well. And you've got to have a piece in place to, um, you know, bring guests back. And, and keep them informed throughout the year and, and want, uh, wanting to return the following year. Right. And I, I, you know, we, we've had multiple guests uh, that have, have really kind of talked about that brand. You have to create that brand. You have to try to differentiate yourself. You have to try to not just look at Airbnb, but try to uh, get direct bookings off the platform because when you're on a particular platform, you're subject to their rules, you're subject to whatever they do, and they're not your customers, they're the platform's customers. But when you have direct bookings and you have their emails, those are your customers. And you know, I, I know I like I see you're wearing the uh, your, your branded shirt, the, the Sasquatch properties. What, what, how have you been able to? Because when we spoke, you said you have about 20% direct bookings. How have you been able to grow that audience or the, that customer base off of the platforms? You know, again, I'm going to point to Google. I think the biggest, one of the biggest things for me has been Google Maps and, and getting my, my properties out there on Google Maps. You know, there's a lot of people that I see that are, you know, discuss in some of these discussion groups, hey, um, do we really want to give people the address of the property? And I say, well, why wouldn't you, you know, they're, they're worried about crime and things. It seems like a little bit um, paranoia to me. Uh, everything's out there on, on the internet these days. Right. I mean, you go to Google maps, you find all kinds of businesses. I'm running a business. I want my business to be found on Google maps or, or even, you know, Microsoft maps or, or, you know, other things like that. So, so that's a big one getting out there on the map software, um, you know, ads on Facebook, ads on Instagram, um, ads on Google AdWords. Uh, those are all great ways to, to get your brand out there and, and become more well-known. Now, are you, are you targeting specific people when you're running these ads, whether it's on Google or Instagram, Facebook, are you targeting specific people and how, how are you targeting? I do. I target people based on, um, Previous guests, what I've seen uh, as far as age range, um, um, and and uh, from from where they where they come from in the country, I'll tell you we get a lot of um, our business from. I would say Texas is is probably the biggest, uh, probably the the state where most of our business comes from outside of Colorado. 
Texas, Texas. So, so what, what is it about Texas that all these people are finding your properties? You know, I, I don't, again, well, they're finding it because that's, that's where I'm advertising. At least I hope, right? Hopefully my marketing is working properly, but um, I think the reason they want to come to Colorado is, I don't know if I was sitting down in Texas, I'm looking at a map, right. And I'm sitting down here in Texas and I want snow. I'm not going to get it here. It's kind of a direct line North uh, to, to, to reach Colorado. Right. So uh, without having to go too far, um, you know, I, we do have people that drive from Texas, although most of them do fly in. Okay. So um, what, what, what do you do that sets your properties apart? Because Colorado, uh, you know, the Denver, Denver area is uh, very, very, um, very busy. You said that your places are up in the Rockies, which I imagine is even, you know, probably even more touristy because a lot of people want to be with the mountains and want to be, um, you know, where, where, the, where the action is. How, how have you been able to set your properties apart amongst the competition? Well, there's a couple of things, really. Um, we're, we're pet friendly wherever we can be, you know, wherever the HOAs allow it. You know, some HOAs only allow pets for the owners. They don't allow you to to rent to people with pets. And I think that's a shame. You know, it's it's our property. We should we should be able to, to do what we want with it. You know, and I understand that um, some of that can be due to people not cleaning up after their pets when they're on vacation. But you have to be vigilant again and, and set expectations uh, you know, we have signs uh, right by the by the door when you're leaving the condo that says, you know, hey, please clean up after your pet just as a reminder. And then we, we put, um, uh, you know, other information about, uh, you know, what's expected in the guidebook, as well as links to a lot of fun things you can do in the area that are pet friendly as well. Um, aside from that, uh, we decorate our properties probably in, in, a, in a very similar style to one another. Um that way, no matter which one of our properties you're staying at year after year, you're, you're going to feel like home. It always feels like you're coming back to the same place, even if you're, you know, in, in Winter Park uh, one year and, and up in Granby the next year. And then um, finally, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a foodie. I like to cook. You know, I cook for, for you know, cook dinner with my family every night. Um, so I make sure all our kitchens are fully equipped. So that uh, other people that like to cook and you know don't want to uh, necessarily spend all their vacation money on uh, you know going out to restaurants all the time. Sure, when you're on vacation, you want to go out to a restaurant, you want to enjoy the local fare, but you know also you you probably want some family time and and especially when you're up in the mountains and you're going skiing, you know it's 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 incredible to you know throw some things in the crock pot, you know have that recipe right there in the guidebook that says hey go get this at the store, bring it back tomorrow morning. You throw it in the crock pot, you go skiing all day, come home. And the place smells like, you know, uh, smells like Tex-Mex chili, you know, and, and you're going to have a nice warm meal after being out in the snow all day. That's, that's really unique. So you're, you're actually, you have the crock pot set up. You're, you're telling people, Hey, this is the tools that are in, you know, this is the, the cookware that's in the house. And here's some recipes that you can even make, you know, uh, just go to the store here and you can just throw this in. And by the time you come back, you can have a nice warm, warm meal. You got it. I mean, when I go on vacation, I don't want to have to think, I don't want to, I just want to enjoy my time. I want to relax. I don't want to have to do a lot of thinking and searching. And hopefully I've done all my searching and my research before I've left for that vacation. And when I get there, if there's anything missing or anything I forgot, I would expect that my host would have it ready for me. And, and you know, here, here's where you want to go for this. Here's where you want to go for food. Um, here's some things you can do if you don't want to do that. You know, here's some great places to explore. If you want to spend some money, here's some high-end places. And if you don't, here's great places to hike and fish, you know. I think I think that's really really unique that you've kind of set your properties as being, you know, you, you you're definitely doing the right thing by making that brand, but your brand is also very homey. It's like if I'm going over to you know to someone's house and they have everything already set up, and I think that that's key that that you want to limit the amount of thinking for guests because if you just give me a crock pot and you say here's a crock pot. Uh, I don't, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I've never used a crock pot before, but if you had like that, that list and that, those recipes and you say, Hey, this is what would be really good. Like, you know, you go out skiing and by the time you come back, you have a nice meal for you. Yeah. My, my guest book has about a dozen recipes in it. And I think eight or nine of them are crock pot recipes. 
That's that's great. And you you mentioned the the pet friendly HOA. So your properties are all at HOAs. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, and w- I hear a lot of uh, negative ne- uh, negative feedback on HOAs. What what's what what are your thoughts and opinions on on HOAs? Um, I, I would say most. I, I've heard a lot of negative feedback on HOAs too, especially because I'm on the board of two of them. But I would say most people that have negative opinions of HOAs just don't understand them. I mean. When you are a homeowner in a community, you are the HOA. I mean, you are a part of that HOA. You are part of the homeowners association, whether you're on the board or not. And a lot of people, what they, you know, their their negative opinions are toward HOAs. And and really what that is, is is towards the board. They think the board wants to make my life miserable. You know, I I don't agree. Like I said before, I, I wish that, um, you know, those that didn't allow me to rent to people with pets, won't allow it, but, or or rather would allow it. But that is what the community decided way back before I ever bought. And it's not the people that are there now necessarily. It's not those five members on the board. It's not the management company that's that's handling that HOA that is making those rules. They're they're enforcing those rules. If if you want to change those rules, then, then get involved in your community, talk to people, say, here's why I want to change the rules. And usually you need about 66% of homeowners to agree with you. And if you get that, you can change the rules of the community. It doesn't have to be, they're not set in stone. It's not easy to do. You know, I've tried to, to you know, work on, uh, I, I don't know, getting proxies for, for annual meetings and things, going door to door, going door to door is never easy. Um, but if you have a Facebook group for your, your community and your HOA and you reach out that way, you can get a lot of great uh, input feedback and um, uh, you know people jumping in to help out that way. That, that's that's really unique and that that's a very um, unique way that you have kind of um, taken taken that because lots of people say just stay away from condos, stay away from HOAs because you know they're 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 evil and they just want to shut your your short term rentals down. But what you're saying is that you know you are the HOA, you and everybody else that's in it, and if you you basically have to be the the uh, uh, the the endorser of short term rentals. You have to educate people. You have to let people know why it's good and why it would actually be good for the HOA. How how have you been able to handle the opposition that has uh, has have you have you ever handled had had to handle opposition uh, to your HOAs or to to your short term renters? Well, you, you make a good point there, and 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 I don't know that it really applies to me because. What you're saying is, you know, a lot of people think oh, HOAs, they won't, they want to shut down my, my short-term rental. And that may be true in some areas. In some areas, uh, people may not want uh, to have short-term renters in their communities, you know, especially in, in you know, the city and, and things like that. Uh, where I'm at, though, I mean, it is a tourist destination. It is, you know, ski resort towns. So it's fully expected that there are going to be short-term rentals there. There always have been, there always will be. What I deal with more than uh, HOAs that are, you know, anti-short-term rental is um, local governments that want to impose more regulations and create more taxes. So, you know, that's another area where people really should be getting involved and making sure that uh, people in government are educated about, you know, that um, uh, what we're bringing to the communities when we bring in these tourists and, and, and the kind of money that it helps bring in and as well as educating them as to uh, how we handle our business and the fact that we're not, um, you know, how do I want to say this? I don't want to say not hands off because yes, I do want to be hands off most of the time, but uh, not inattentive, um, you know, not absentee landlords. You know, if there are is- if there are issues, we do handle those issues. But generally, where I'm at, again, ski resort yeah, towns, you, you don't have a whole lot of issues from my experience. Not if you set proper expectations out of the gate with your with your customers and guests. And you mentioned local governments. Is is that something that you are also active in? Are you actively, um, you know, um, bringing your case to local governments that try to suppress or try to increase taxes on short term rentals? I have brought my opinions before uh, to to uh, town meetings and such when when they have um, 
trying to enact some of these new laws and some of them have been enacted and uh, some of them have been changed before they were enacted, which is good. You know, if you get enough feedback from enough concerned parties, uh, those in government do listen because, you know, again, we are all part of a community, right? So whether we're the landlords or whether we're renting to the people that are coming to stay or whether we're working with the people that live in the community and, and that are sometimes impacted by, by short-term rentals, you know, the only way we're going to uh, figure out how to all get along is, is to come together and, and talk about these things and, and work towards solutions. I think, uh, Gary, that, that you, that you're, you're, you're really hitting on, on, on a big thing that not enough people maybe realize is that, you know, the, the HOAs, the condos, the governments, that's all, you know, that's all us, you know, we're the people that, that create the rules. We're also the people that can change the rules. You know, if we don't like a particular politician, we can, you know, that's, that's what it means to be in a, in a democratic state. You know, we have the choice to be able to change those things, but it, you have to also take action. Um, and, and just to plug in here, you know, I just started a local meetup in the in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area for hosts to be able to meet. And we also do have a group uh, called Citizens for Short Term Renters that is very vocal and very, uh, you know, trying to, you know, fight for short term rentals in this area. Because, you know, being in the tri-state, we have lots of lots of different rules, lots of different politicians and regulations and, you know, having a community base that that can get together hosts that can you know, talk about things, talk about the changes, talk about the rules and actually go to town meetings, go to um, these these uh, things that could definitely affect, you know, the short term rental community. It's it's definitely important and it needs to be more, more well, it needs to be more active, acted upon. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I also host a meetup on the south side of Denver here. So I know what you're talking about there. And it is important to uh, you know, not just work within the bounds of the governmental uh, structure, but also to, you know, work with our peers in in, in the short-term rental industry and in real estate in general, and you know, uh, be able to tap into that and and find out what's going on, hear what's hear what's happening in in other places that maybe I'm not currently renting in the county next door, but you know, hearing about what's going on over there um, can can you know better prepare me for things that might be changing in my region. Right. Is there, is there any product that you couldn't live without in your rentals that has saved you time and money? So it's something maybe like, uh, like a particular washcloth or, or, or bed sheets or anything that has been able to save you time and money. Um, you know, I, I would say that, that there's two things that I do. Um, and, and maybe this goes back to the question about setting myself apart from the others too. You know, I, I do, one of the things I do is I do branded water bottles and I put a couple of those in the fridge all the time. And I think people really do appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and I don't have any to show, but, um, you know, we do little, we put together little toiletry bags, um, uh, that go in the bathrooms. Uh, they, they cost probably $3 to make maybe at the top end. And they have, you know, um, your, your conditioner, shampoo, lotion, which is really important here in, in Colorado. A lot of people don't realize they're coming from somewhere uh, that's a little more humid. Your skin can dry out really quickly here. Um, and then there's some body wash as well. That way, you know, we're not have to worry about bar soaps. People don't have to worry about bringing their own or going out to buy it if they've forgotten it, which is what happens most often. People really do appreciate that. There's also some cotton swabs and um, Q-tips that we throw in there, uh, as well as um, a lip balm. So, uh, and again, your lips tend to dry out pretty quickly here, especially if you're not drinking a lot of water, which uh, people aren't always used to, especially if they're coming up from somewhere that's uh, closer to sea level and a lot more humid. Now, now, what you know, I, I see that you have a lot of a lot of branded material. What what is it? Why do you think it's so important to brand your properties? Why don't you just have, you know, five properties that are just kind of all, you know, unique and, and, and set apart? Why, why is it so important to you to brand your properties? Well, you know, a lot of people look to, I, I talked about list, listing site independence before. Uh, there's a whole movement of, of book direct people out there. Um, 
you can talk about it until you're blue in the face and people will still go to their favorite online travel agency just because that's what they remember. Uh, however, even if that's how they want to continue to book, I mean, I do have repeat bookings that come through Airbnb every year and, and that's great. That's what I'm after. You know, there is a lot of competition out there and it, it continues. I mean, there's more and more talk. There's more and more groups. There's more and more podcasts, you know, about short-term rentals every single day. And there's a lot of people that come on. They think, you know, this is a quick and easy way to make money. And, um, I wouldn't say it's quick and I wouldn't say it's easy. It's just like any other real estate venture. It can be very lucrative in the long run. And uh, it does take some, some work to get it off the ground. You know, again, going back to automation, do I want it to be a lot of work? Heck no. Uh, you know, I like building the systems that make uh, things easier for me. So uh, that that's where I sit with it. And- what would, what would you do differently if you had to start from scratch? Hmm. You know, that's an interesting question. I often think um, if I started all over again, that I would probably, uh, that first property, I would probably hire out the remodel rather than doing it myself. Um, that way I could get a lot done a lot more quickly and, and, and put it on the market sooner and, and, and start, you know, bringing in rental income. However, I've also hired out remodel work in the past and not been happy with the results. And uh, quite frankly, lately I've tried to hire out uh, remodel work only to realize that I, I can't find good help. That's not booked out six months in advance. Um, so I guess, I guess what I would do is I would realize that um, realize what I'm good at, you know, and what I enjoy doing. I really do enjoy building and, uh, and remodeling is right up my alley. Um, so, you know, I, I, I try to automate and outsource all those things, um, you know, that, that take a lot of time or especially those that I don't do well. But uh, starting from scratch, I would realize that when there is something I enjoy doing and I do it well, uh, stick with it, keep it for myself and, and not agonize over it, you know, and not, not say, hey, it's something I need to get off my plate. I think that's a really good point, Gary, because, you know, being, being entrepreneurial, being, um, people that want to be able to, you know, this is, this is your home. This is your, your, your properties. You want to be able to, uh, get it right. But there's a lot of things that can be involved in short-term rentals, you know, with SEOs, uh, you know, search engine optimization, building a brand, building the websites, you know, photography, decorating, renovating, it can be a lot. And some, some people can become overwhelmed because they think they have to do everything, but that's not the case. You don't have to do everything. There's people that can do it for you. Right. Building a team is really important. You've got to have people, especially, again, especially for those things that you, you have to be able to recognize those things that you don't do well and you have to farm those out. But uh, again, you know, realizing what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, keeping that to yourself is, is key because, you know, those are probably some of the reasons that we, we, we are entrepreneurs to begin with. Now, Gary, is there, is there anything that you do that has helped your guests leave positive reviews? Um. Uh, I hope so. I hope everything I do <laughs> uh, helps my guests to leave positive reviews. But yeah, like I said earlier, one of the things we do, we um, we reach out to them we, with an automated email three days after the stay, and and again we ask them, hey, you know, if you had a great time, uh, please leave us a, a a five star review. We we ask for it outright. We say, please give us a five star review. Um, if you had a great time, leave leave us one on on Facebook. Leave us one on the OTA you booked with. Or leave us one on Google. We're, we're happy to get them anywhere or all of those places. And, uh, you know, we, we point out that if if you didn't uh, have a good time for whatever reason or had any issue, we, 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 we hope you would have left. Uh, sorry, hope you would have taken the time to uh, let us know during your stay so we had an opportunity to fix it. But but if not, please, please let us know now. Just Just respond to our email and let us know so that we can fix it for the next guests. Yeah, there's there's no shame in asking for that five that five star review if you're putting in the work and you're putting in the effort. And unless they complained about something, then there there should be no reason why they shouldn't give a five star. Is there is there one house rule that has really saved your butt before? One house rule that has saved my butt. You know, I I don't know if it, I. 
I don't know, because everybody seems to follow it, which is great. So I don't know if it's just because, you know, if it saved my butt or if it's just because people don't smoke anymore. But, you know, we don't allow smoking at all in the units. That can be a real problem, especially when you're doing uh, same day turnovers. And we do a lot of same day turnovers. If you find that somebody has uh, smoked in your unit, it's going to smell. It's going to result in, you know, not getting a five star review. If you're lucky, you'll get, you know, two stars. Um, people do not like to come into a unit and smell smoke. So you got to be vigilant about that. And you've got to be prepared for uh, people abusing your trust and not following your rules and doing it anyway. And the best way to do that, I think, for this particular house rule is to make sure that your housekeeper has a, what do they call it, an ozonator, uh, I think is what they call it, an air cleaner that uses, you know, um, uh, ozone to to clean smells out of the air. It really can make a difference. It really can save your butt if someone has broken that rule. Ozone cleaner. Uh, that, that's a pretty unique unique thing. Um I, that, that, that's pretty interesting. If if you could give one piece of advice to someone who's trying to start their Airbnb business, what would that be? Well, I think it'd be two pieces of advice, and and they sound like opposing ideas, but but they're really not. Um, first, I would say, don't be cheap. You know, you're trying to build a business, so you're trying to maximize profit. I get that, but. You, you do have to spend a little money to make some money, right? You've got to make sure that you've got the right team and systems in place and working for you, you know, well before you start to, to scale your business past one property. Uh, again, those things that you, you recognize that you're not good at, you really need to uh, find a way to, to pay someone else to do those for you. Uh, you probably want a, a good PMS system. Um, you know, a good PMS system can make or break your business, I think. Uh, and unless you have a background in finance, you, you probably definitely want a good CPA uh, to help you with your books. Um, you know, again, an OTA can drop you in a, an online travel agency. They can drop you in a heartbeat for whatever reason they like. So, you know, if you're not working towards listing site independence uh, by putting your money back into uh, business software, your team, your marketing, uh, you really should be. And then I think the other piece I learned and I learned it the hard way is, you know, don't give anyone a discount. It's as simple as that. Uh, and again, it sounds, um, it sounds the opposite of don't be cheap, right? But um, don't give anybody a discount. Oftentimes, new people in this business, like like I did when I was new in the business, you know, I thought I needed to jump on the first potential booking that came along all the time. Um, so even if people ask for a discount, I would say, oh, okay, sure, you know, and then. Um, you know, not realizing that if I just wait, things will book up. If you, if you're doing your business correctly, if you're running your business correctly, if you have a nice place people want to stay at, no matter how much competition you have, your place will book up. For me, it's usually two to four weeks out is when everything fills up for me. Uh, sometimes it doesn't, there's exceptions to that rule. But in my experience, the vast majority of the time, when people ask for a discount, they are the people that are going to require more of my time. And, and again, I'm trying to automate. I'm trying to spend more time with my family. I have a full-time job already. I, you know, I, I want you to have a great time and I put everything in place so that you do. And you don't need a lot of my assistance while you're there. I don't know why, but those people that come right out of the gate asking for a discount usually end up taking up more of my time during their stay. And they don't, often take very good care of the property. And uh, it, aside from that, no matter how far above and beyond you go, you're probably not going to get that five-star review that you want either. So, you know, I simply tell people now, you know, I have an, again, automated message or, or I have one, in, maybe it's manual because I have to see that they're asking for the discount and I have to say, oh, I got to go choose this message and, and send it over. But it, it's a template, right? And it says, you know, it politely says, look, you know, we don't give discounts. Uh, our prices are competitive um, for, for what we see with local hotels and our competition. And we think our amenities are better than theirs anyway. And uh, I'm sure you're going to find accommodations that fit within your budget. So, you know, thank you. So do you not utilize the um, Airbnb discounts when, whenever they offer those those discounts on, on the platforms? 
I do not. I have found that those do not work in my region. They are not set properly. Okay. And where where do you see short term rent- rentals in the future? Wow, that's an interesting question. Hopefully, um, right about where they are today, because they're they're working out really well for me. Uh, I think in the future we'll see a lot of let's call it shaking out in the industry. I mean, we've got a lot of people coming in, uh, again, thinking that this is a quick and easy way to make money. It's not quick. It's not easy. Just like any real estate, again, it's lucrative, but, um, you know, you build that wealth over time and and through hard work. And so I think a lot of people that are uh, getting into it, uh, will probably fall out of it not too far down the road, especially with the changing uh, landscape of, of short-term rental laws. You know, like, um, Denver has already, like last year, passed laws that don't allow people to rent uh, short-term unless they live in the property. So it's home share only. You can't do a whole house rental like I do. Um, so you have to live there permanently. A lot of people skirt these ru- these rules and uh, they claim it's a gray area, but it's not. It's simply illegal. And there are reasons why it's illegal. Uh, we not may not always be privy to those reasons because we haven't done the research, or maybe we just don't like them and we don't want to figure out why they've made these decisions. But the fact of the matter is uh, those rules are there for some reason. And um, they are turning up enforcement. So again, Denver enacted those rules about a year ago. We're seeing signs now that they are, after they've had it in place for a year, they're starting to enforce those rules. So I think it's going to even things out in the industry. It's not going to be so saturated as it has become in some areas. Awesome. Yeah, really, really great insight. I, I definitely agree that there, there, there's a lot of interest in Airbnb, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of new new people saying here, you know, sign up for this course or do this thing and you can you can, you know, make make money and, you know, uh, become financially free. But, you know, it's it's real estate and it's it, it takes a lot of real work. You know, you have people like yourself that have been doing this for over, you know, over five years. Um, and it, it definitely is not a quick buck. But uh, it is a way to, there, there are ways that you can automate it. And I think that you're doing a really good job, you know, having your W2 and, and, and being able to scale that. Is there any way that people can reach you, Gary? Yeah, you can reach me at, um, the email at Gary at Sasquatch dot vacations, no.com just Sasquatch dot vacations, or you can visit my website at Sasquatch dot vacations. Okay, and of course, we'll include everything in the show notes. Uh, if you want the show notes for this episode, just go on over to airbnbss.com, and we will have those uh, for you. But thank you so much, Gary, for taking the time to to speak with us and to educate us. I think you're uh, an inspiration. I think that that's um, really cool that you've been able to do this this uh, this part time, but you're you're scaling it up, and eventually, you know, I'm I'm sure that you'll be able to have this fully automated and just be able to relax and you know let the system take care of itself. Well, thank you, Julian. It's been a pleasure sharing my story today. I really appreciate your time. All right. Take care, everybody. Till next time, keep on hosting. Hope you host benefited from the show. Like any exceptional host, we all strive for five-star reviews. So please go on over to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever you're frequently listening to the show and leave us an honest review. Let us know what we're doing right or how we can improve because that's what we want to do. We want to become better hosts. I want to become a better podcast host and a better Airbnb host. Talk to you guys in the next episode. Peace out.